Hello, and thanks for tuning into this part of our video series titled Under Pressure, a focus series on hypertension. This video will focus on calcium channel blockers as a treatment for hypertension. Calcium channel blockers are a very heterogeneous class of medications that we tend to broadly categorize into one of two groups, non-dihydropyridine and dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers. The former, consisting of diltiazem and verapamil, will be talked about first, and the latter, consisting of amlodipine and ifedipine, as well as some others, will be talked about second. Although the pharmacologic effects of each of these classes varies considerably, they each inhibit the influx of extracellular calcium into the cardiac and smooth muscle cells. The key difference is what tissues and organ systems these agents are most selective for. Non-dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers, such as diltiazem and verapamil, inhibit calcium channels within nodal tissue as well as the myocardium. Of these two medications, verapamil is the most selective for cardiac tissue and causes lesser vasodilation than does diltiazem. Because of their impact on the SA and the AV nodes, as well as the myocardium, non-dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers are used predominantly for arrhythmias and angina and are relatively infrequently used just for hypertension. Because of the negative inotropic effects of diltiazem and verapamil, these agents are absolutely contraindicated in patients with a reduced left ventricular ejection fraction. Unlike beta blockers, long-term use of these agents in patients with heart failure is not associated with mortality benefit and indeed is a class 3 indication for potential harm. In addition, patients with acute myocardial infarction or cardiogenic shock are contraindicated to receive these uh, medications, uh, as well as any sort of conduction abnormalities, such as sick sinus syndrome or heart block. On each of these next two slides, you can identify the various formulations of diltiazem and verapamil, as well as what their starting dose and usual dose is. I would like to point out, although I won't read through everything on these tables, that it is important to identify which formulation of diltiazem and verapamil is being used. They have slightly different pharmacokinetics, they might be dosed once a day versus twice a day, and uh, may not be interchangeable. So it's important to recognize which formulation is being prescribed and, and make sure that you're substituting for an AB rated generic. Adverse effects of non-dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers include constipation, which is a bigger issue with verapamil than it is with diltiazem, uh, as well as gingival hyperplasia, edema, and bradycardia. Moving on to the dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers, we have first, second, and third generations. The drugs predominantly work on the vasculature, causing more vasodilation and blood pressure lowering than perhaps with the non-dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers. The key difference in each generation is the pharmacokinetic properties of the drug. Nifedipine immediate release, which is a first generation dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker, has a very rapid onset of action and can actually be harmful in certain patients, such as uh, when used in hypertensive emergency due to the dramatic blood pressure lowering effects we can see. For these reasons, the first generation dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers are rare, rarely used orally for hypertension. On the contrary, second and third generation dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers have a longer half-life and thus provide a more consistent, less rapid change in blood pressure. Contraindications for dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers include a reduced left ventricular ejection fraction. Of note, the exception to this is amlodipine, which has been shown not to worsen mortality. It doesn't improve mortality either, but we know that it doesn't worsen mortality and may be beneficial in patients who are already on goal-directed medical therapy yet remain hypertensive. In addition, patients who have had a recent myocardial infarction may not be the best candidate for a dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker due to potential coronary steel phenomenon that occurs from coronary vasodilation. However, it should be noted that this data is um, mostly with immediate release nifedipine, which as we already mentioned has a very rapid reduction in blood pressure uh, that is not seen with the second and third generation calcium channel blockers. Additionally, patients with severe aortic stenosis um, should use caution in, in implementing calcium channel blockers such as nifedipine or amlodipine simply because of the peripheral vasodilation that can occur um, as well as potential too rapid reduction in afterload.
On this slide, you can see the various calcium and channel blockers that are approved for the treatment of hypertension, as well as what a typical starting dose, maximal effective dose, and how frequently they're administered. It is worth noting that this is not an exhaustive list and that other calcium channel blockers do exist. However, they may not be approved for the treatment of hypertension. Adverse effects of dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers are somewhat different than those of the non-dihydropyridines. Edema tends to be more common with dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers owing to the peripheral dilation that occurs. Gingival hyperplasia might be slightly more common in the dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker group as well. In addition, we can see flushing and a heat sensation in anywhere from 10 to 25% of patients initiated on dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers. And then in addition, although it's not listed here, um, acid reflux or heartburn occurs in up to 10% of patients due to relaxation of the pyloric sphincter. That concludes this presentation on calcium channel blockers for the treatment of hypertension.